Um, okay, so hi, thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Selvig. I'm the Family Services Vista at Habitat Minnesota. I am a graduate of Luther College with degrees in anthropology and history. But while I'm here, I'm working on um, I'm working on the Family Services Technical Assistance Project with a few affiliates. But I just want to let you know I'm also available at any time if you have questions. Um, related to family services, feel free to give me a call or send me an email if you have any of those questions. I'm always happy to help. And then recently I conducted an affiliate mortgage servicing and delinquency survey and I talked to 28 affiliates with that and so I'll be pulling up some of those results later too. Okay, so what we've got here is that most of the time when we think of mortgage delinquencies and handling that, we often think of post-purchase support. Um, but, and we're going to be spending a lot of today's forum talking about those aspects of managing delinquency, but it is also important to talk about what your affiliate can do earlier in the process to help prevent a delinquency problem from ever, from ever coming up in the first place. And that's through a thorough family selection process and a robust homeowner education program. And so first, um, I want to get a sense of how people are feeling about delinquency at your affiliates. And so I have a quick poll. Perfect. So what this is asking, you're going to say um, how, how you view your delinquency program problem. Or they're not necessarily a problem, but you can say if there's, it's scary, it's a significant problem, it's so-so or it needs improvement, um, it's okay, we have some delinquency, but the vast majority of homeowners pay, or fantastic, we don't have any problems, or you don't know. And this is anonymous, you don't have to worry about <laughs> me knowing who's answering, you can be very honest. We'll give it a few more seconds, but it's looking like a lot of people say it's okay. Great. So 74% of you say it's okay that you have some, but a lot, most of your homeowners are paying on time. That's great. 16% um, say so-so and use improvement. Well, that's great that you hear then. We're going to talk about some ways to improve that. And then 11% say scary. It's a significant problem, which, again, it's great that you're here. We're going to talk about it. So what I did, part of the thing that I did in my survey is asked you guys what your delinquency rates are. And so this is self-reported numbers. Um, they're not uh, official by any means, I just asked. Um, this is from the survey I just conducted. And then according to Habitat International, more than 20% delinquency rate is a problem. So within this box, if you're within this box, you're doing okay, according to Habitat International. Um, so basically what I want to see is what your reactions are to this list of how affiliates are doing. If you Are you surprised by anything? It looks like the most people are within 11 to 15% delinquency rate and are within the box, and so that's good. We do have six affiliates that have 5% or lower delinquency rate, which is fabulous. So if you want to, if you have comments on that, you can type them into the chat or raise your hand. Um, I also want to point out that this was done, the survey was done in the end of December, early January, which is t uh, typically not <laughs> the best time for delinquency rates, so that could be pushing some numbers up too. All right, well, let's see if there are no questions. Yeah, no comments yet unless somebody is busy case... typing. But if they are, I will let you know. <laughs> typing away. Okay, great. Um, so in that case, we are going to move on to... I have this question for you, and so if you're eager to participate, this is another great opportunity. Um, because at this point, we should all know that controlling delinquencies is very important for the success and sustainability of the affiliate. It does. Um, there's a lot of problems with having a, a high delinquency rate, but having a low one means that you're 
continuously getting that money back and your reputation is usually better, but the process is not fun. I know all of you have gone through it, um, of talking to a homeowner that's been delinquent. I know I've talked to many affiliates that get frustrated or distraught when a homeowner doesn't pay. Now, there, there is a fairly straightforward process laid out by mortgage laws and about how to proceed when a homeowner becomes delinquent, but what I'm interested in is why do you guys think the situation is often so difficult for affiliates? Or maybe so more difficult than for banks or for credit unions? If you have any thoughts or any experiences that were particularly difficult. Let's see. I am unmuting Pam. Pam, are you with us? I am. Great. Hi, Pam. Hi. Um, I think it's difficult because we formed a relationship with this couple. It's not like just going in the bank and asking for a mm -hmm. loan and that type of thing, but we've already formed a relationship, worked alongside of them for the build and the education classes, and also we tried to educate them as to the importance of this loan that they have with the 0% interest. So I think it's frustrating for us after all that education and working alongside um, to have this happen. Right. No, and then um, we have several people that are kind of echoing what you were saying that are agreeing with you. Right. A, a, a number of, of people wrote in about just that relationship piece. Um, Michelle says the very program denotes that affiliate leaders become partners slash friends. Then later, it is difficult to be tough. Um, Jerry points out mostly that she thinks it's mostly because we are mission driven, not profit driven. Mm -hmm. um, Angie says we are relying on this money, the fund for humanity, to be able to work with more families in the future. Uh, another Don says we are all volunteers and did not know how to deal with this. The no interest does not provide incentive to get them to pay. Um, and then Eileen added that homeowners also feel a sense of guilt and shame regarding delinquency. Right. And so these are all very fair points. So the, the issue of that we have a different relationship with these homeowners than most banks, I think, is a very important part. Um, and so what we want to do is really figure have, out the best way one more, one to more approach comment. this. Sorry, yeah, Rachel, yeah. there's one more comment I just wanted to make sure to share. Mm -hmm. um, Bridget just added, but if the homeowners show signs of trying to repay, there is wiggle room before foreclosure. Friend or not, right. they need to hold up their end of the deal. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we'll be discussing later on is how much wiggle room you should be giving, affili or giving homeowners and how to manage that. So that's great. Um, so, in order to prevent even having to go there, really, with homeowners, the goal is always to prevent issues of delinquency from coming up in the first place. Right, so, um, in order to do that, we're going to take a look back at how your family selection process can help you set up for a successful homeowners partnership. So, first off, we have we have this little scenario that we're going to work with here to see what the important things are. So we have two families in this hypothetical situation. We're going to say that all aspects of these families are the same except for what I have here. So the first family, we have a family of four. Their income is 30% of area median income, so it's low, and they have $500 in medical debt. And then the second family, again a family of four, a little bit of a higher income with 40% AMI, but they also have $1,500 in credit card debt. And so what I'm wondering is what I want to hear from you guys is what are the policies that would be important to look at in this scenario? So what policies would it be important to have in order to choose between these two families? Um, say if you're thinking about setting up a successful partnership where the homeowner is able to afford the monthly mortgage payments, 
um, so you take away some of the problems with delinquency that they just can't afford it, then what questions do you need to ask about these two families? So both Susie and Angie mentioned the debt to income ratio. Great. That's very important. And so you'd have to have a policy in place that says what debt to income ratio is acceptable and which is not. Uh, Bridget adds, does the debt affect their ability to pay? And Michelle mentions mm -hmm. their credit report history, credit history. Great. Uh, Jerry mentions also that it depends on the payment history on credit cards and whether it surpasses the debt to income ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, another person mentions credit report is important. Also medical bills are different than purchases. Mm -hmm. Lots of evaluating credit history, on time payments, credit score, debt to income. This is great. So keep those coming in and then also say I add in here that family one has a good payment history and family two has a history of missed payments. Now, um, now if we have that. Uh, there's a couple more um, uh, and Susie just had added, are they paying this debt on time or delinquent? And so we got <laughs> that. Go. There we go. Smart. And uh, another question though that Kevin added he, that he would ask how old is the debt and is further medical debt continuing to accrue? Ah, yes. Also very good. Good questions. And so basically what I'm hoping this demonstration shows is that you're, you guys are asking all the right questions and I love it. Um, the other thing to note here is that with delinquency issues, it's um, far more correlated to credit history than just to income. So even though we have a family, family two here has a higher income, their history of missed payments might be more of a red flag and their higher debt amount might be more of a red flag than this family one's low income, if you want to think about it from further down the road. Uh, Rachel, we have somebody with their, Stacy has her hand raised. Oh, um, so great. I'm just going to see if she still wants to comment for us. Hi, Stacy. Hi, Stacy. Hi, I just can't see the chat going on. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Oh, no, you know what? Uh, not everybody can see the chat. I just... I can only share that. So those are private. That's why I would. Oh, read, gotcha. Read Sorry. Nope, that's a great question. So if we have a question, we just do the hand raise thing, right? You can raise your hand and talk to everybody, or you can just type it in, and then well, that's why I I'm. I can see where to type in. That's where I'm having in problems. The, there's a question panel that you just type into. No, that's not even showing up. So I'll just be quiet. <laughs> or if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand, and we can talk to you. Okay, so let's see. Um, so this, we might be coming back to these two families, so remember them. But then another thing that is very important um, to talk about is if you want to make sure that a family can afford your house, then you have to be looking at what your lower income limit is. And so this, uh, these next two slides are from a presentation last year with um, a Family Services Vista in Douglas County and then the Family Services Vista before me here. And so I'm just going to go over this briefly, but what basically what this is saying is that house pricing is the biggest influence on your minimum income limit, or it should be. Because a lot of people, if you see here, a lot of people say, let's look at area median income and then see what 30% of that for a four-person house, and this is from Douglas County again, um, is $19,100. But if you look at what your estimated monthly payment is, and I know that's sometimes hard to estimate, but you can set a goal and say if you think that your monthly payment is going to be $600 um, and you want the person paying that to not be cost burdened by that, which means they, it has to be less than 30% of their income, then their monthly minimum income is going to be $2,000. And you times that by 12 for 12 months, and then that says the minimum annual income has to be $24,000, which is significantly higher than 30% area median income. And so that means no matter how many people they have in their house, they really should, at a minimum, have $24,000 in order to not be cost burdened by that payment. And so you can also um, 
calculate this the other way too if you're trying to figure out what your monthly payment should be you can take what the area median income is say for example it's 18,000 divided by 12 to get a monthly income of 1500 and then if you want them to not be cost burdened it has to be 30% um, of that is 450 so it has to be a max monthly payment of $450 and then you can calculate that out to see what your house cost with their mortgages they're going to become delinquent and I know I just went over this very quickly and um, I encourage people to look at Zach's and Aaron's presentation if you have more questions um, and if you want access to that presentation I would feel I'd be happy to send it to you you can let me know after the forum because there's really some interesting stuff in there and there's much longer than what I just covered <laughs> All right, so if we're moving on to homeowner education part of it, um, basically, we're going to start with financial literacy is great, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, most people should know that homeowner education is a very important part of what Habitat affiliates do to ensure the people we partner with are successful homeowners. Um, and again, not surprisingly, financial literacy is the foundation for preventing homeowner delinquency down the road and almost every affiliate does it in some format um, so that's great what I found is I was looking at the delinquency rates that I just co uh, calculate or Rachel, collected Rachel can I jump in with some yeah. questions yes uh, yes absolutely um, okay there's quite a few so oh. uh, just what Pam is asking if the maximum monthly payment includes escrow. Well, it should. Right. Because uh, you're calculating how much they pay for housing total. And another question about what is the average AMI percentage of approved families in Minnesota? I actually don't know that, but that's a fascinating question, and I will. Yeah, find of out. approved families, right? Right. Um, and what about considering utility costs into the cost burden? Right. Yeah, and so that was a very simple, I can go back to that. Um, that was a very, very simplified explanation of it, just for simplicity's sake. And so what you would have to do at your affiliate then is to also include, or try your best to include utility costs and escrow and anything that they're paying for housing should theoretically be less than 30% of their income. And then also it should be, the important part of that, it should be less than 30%. So as low as you can go is is the best. So Michelle was adding something about outstate AMI in Minnesota. Um, is about 73,000 right. affiliates are allowed up to 50% AMI. I'm not sure if you want to comment on those. Oh, I can't actually see what that is. What did you say? Can you repeat? Oh. Uh, Michelle was commenting about um, what she thought the Greater Minnesota or Outstate AMI was and that affiliates were allowed to go up to 50 mm percent. -hmm. But I'm going to let Susan has her hand raised. Let's let Susan chime in here, okay? Oh, yep. Hi, Susan. You know, I don't have headphones. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so it, it varies by county if you go by the HUD guidelines. Mm -hmm. And it varies by family size. So it's hard to say that outstate is 73,000. HFHI allows you to go actually up to 80%, but in general they recommend up to 60% of AMI. Um, but for all of Habitat Minnesota funding programs, you can only go up to 50% AMI. So how's that for confusion? <laughs> No, I, was trying, I was trying to clear things up, not sure that happened. <laughs> right, so the upper limit of AMI gets confusing, and it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but generally, family size and, um, and geography do influence it a little bit. Right. Right, and so what I... What I'm hoping to emphasize here is that the minimum AMI isn't necessarily just going to be 30%. And so that the minimum AMI is where you can run into some issues with delinquency if you're not careful. Okay. 
Parker also has his hand raised, and then I, I'm mm-hmm. sure you want to move into the um, delinquency stage of things here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so let me just <laughs> unmute Parker, and we'll go from there. There we go. Hi, Parker. I have a question for – hi. Um, hi. question for Susan, since you just talked about um, – you know the the AMI and what and what you use for your CRV and FH Federal Home Loan Bank um, grants, um, and that's just a fixed. No, I mean that's just one a flat number. It's not it's not it's independent of family size, um, and uh, you know this is just a, more of a question about you know where that comes from. Um, how do you come up with that number? Sure. The um, CRV or impact fund, as we call it now, is a flat number. It's not adjusted for family size, and that's dictated by MHFA. Okay. So they have they have a kind of a statewide number then that they, they do. base that right on. Now, okay. Right now, it's it 50 percent. It's 37,100. Contrary okay. to that, is Federal Home Loan Bank. They do not have that same restriction. For federal home loan bank qualification, you can use either HUD or the MRB, which stands for Mortgage Revenue Bond Income Guidelines, and those are more liberal or less liberal depending on family size, but they're both quite a bit higher than the CRV. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Great. Thanks, Susan, for clearing that up. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to move on to... Let's see, going back to homeowner education, I can just really quickly go over this. Um, Basically what I'm saying here is that there, I separated this out when when I was looking at data to the affiliates that with their financial literacy education outsourced it into one of these, um, one of these programs here, Financial Peace University, Homestretch, um, FAME, or Lutheran Social Services Counseling or did it in-house or brought in community members to do it. And what I found here, I'll just go over this really quickly, is that the affiliates that had the lowest delinquency rate tended to outsource a financial literacy education. Um, and that is the main thing I wanted to say there. Let's see. Okay, so I know the main thing that people wanted to talk about today were the post-purchase support, and so we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about this. Um, And then first off, I wanted to share some results of the affiliate survey that I just did, and so um, the main question here is that when when you're handling uh, Mortgages, do you have them serviced by a third party or are you servicing your own mortgages? And so what I found out of the 28 affiliates that I talked to, 20 years said yes, that they have it outsourced. Um, Six said no, and then the other two were ones that were in transition, so are are about to get a third party servicer type of thing. Of the ones that have a third party servicing their mortgages, I asked, what is the servicer in charge of doing and what is the affiliate in charge of doing. And it shouldn't be terribly surprising to find that the graphs are inverted. So all, all 20 affiliates that said that they had their um, mortgages serviced say that the servicer is in charge of collecting payments. That's not surprising. Most of them are sending late notices and then from there it goes down or how many talk with delinquent homeowners and provide financial counseling resources. Um, and then the opposite is true of the affiliates. So when you look at this, not very many collect payments, but then as you get into the more personal aspects of delinquency, like talking with the homeowners and providing um, providing those resources, then that goes up. And the other important thing to notice is that there are some that do both, that have the servicer that are talking with delinquent homeowners, but then the affiliate will also take control of that too. Um, so you have double the help happening there, which I thought was great. The other thing is that um, on the other side of the spectrum, affiliates that have their or do their own servicing of their mortgages, this is just quick here out of the eight people or the eight affiliates that do that, five of them say that the executive director is in charge of collecting payments. 
um, or most of the time it's either the executive director or staff, which is great. Then the interesting thing is that, oops, sorry, um, that none of the people that service their own mortgages report to credit bureaus, which is just an interesting thing to do. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute too. So that's what I have for the um, survey results. And now the rest of this time, I really want to have you guys talking to each other about your thoughts on these topics. So we have third-party services versus self-servicing, whether or not to report to credit bureaus, things like automatic mortgage payments or an automatic withdrawal, and um, flexibility with struggling homeowners. So we're going to start with I'm bringing back this graphic just to remind you. And I want to hear from you guys what there are 20 affiliates that say that they get their mortgages serviced by third parties. So what are the benefits of having a third party servicer? Why do you do that? Or if you don't have a servicer and that's a conscious decision, why why have you decided against it? Or what are your reasons behind that? So I know I talk to a lot of people about this. All right. Let's see. Um, so I have a few questions. I don't know if they're particularly in response to. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So there was a question about do the third party or do, must be do affiliates who use a third party servicer do the book work too, or does the affiliate treasurer still take care of that? Mm. And I think that's, Trying to look and see. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just let some other affiliates chime in about how they <laughs> operate that. But uh, right. and I didn't do that a, specific either. Yeah, there's a request for uh, an intervention timeline, which I think we're going to get to. Um, mm -hmm. And then another comment that just said there, our affiliate has decided against mortgage servicing because they feel that they won't have the control to help the homeowner get caught up on their mortgages if they fall behind. So some of those comments actually might uh, trigger some more questions and comments. I know we have some right. hands raised as well, but there's lots and lots of comments here too. Uh, let's see. So Angie responded, though, we have our mortgages serviced by a bank, but we still have all of the information on our books. Uh, another person said, we have not moved to a third-party servicer because of cost and depersonalizing of our program. However, with the new regulations and increasing volume, we are likely to move to a third party. Yep. Uh, uh, Kathy commented, and, and as somebody who has a great mortgage portfolio, it makes the homeowner more accountable if they make a payment to a financial, financial institution rather than us. Hmm. Uh, Somebody else commented that we are required by Habitat Minnesota programs and we do not have the capacity. Um, and some other questions here about of the eight affiliates servicing their own, how many do they service compared to those outsourcing? That's a, yeah, it's a, interesting mm. to think about what the size of the portfolio that they're using. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but um, let me see if I have that information. Based on, on, off the top of my head, I would say that. A lot of the people that are not getting their mortgages serviced have generally smaller portfolios, but I don't know that for a fact. Oh, let's just... see. One person just commented 15 mortgages here if they're, that they are servicing on on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Let's get to some of the hands raised. I know I have other comments. If I haven't mentioned your comment yet, there's just a lot, which is fantastic, but I want to see who's got their hand raised so we can listen to them. How about Tudor? We'll talk to her first. Hi there. Let's see, Tudor, are you there? Go for it, Lori. Oh, or Lori, you oh, must have a team of people. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and meet you guys. All right. And I'm wondering if someone wants to talk, if... If someone out there has their mortgage service by a third party wants to talk about managing that um, flexibility with homeowners still. 
or how how you do that where if someone comes in and says they're having trouble if you can still talk to them or rework situations all right Angie says that she can talk about that great Let's see here. We've got a, and we've got a couple other hands raised then too. But mm -hmm. uh, Angie, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you first if I could find you. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi, Angie. Hi. So we do have a bank service our mortgages, but we are the ones that have any communication as far as if the families have any problems, they need to contact us. The bank strictly takes the payment. Sends mm -hmm. out notices. And then they send out the first couple, like, late notices. Um, you know, once it gets to 30 days, we're the ones that send any delinquency notices. And um, they have to contact us for any, you know, payment modifications or um, to talk to us about anything. Yeah, that's great. And that, um, that's pretty standard of when I was talking to people about the survey, too, as I asked those questions, is... Um, and I didn't get a single affiliate that said that they weren't able to work with the homeowner, even if they had a third party servicer. All right. Uh, let's see. I think there were some other hands up that maybe went down. So if you still want to talk with us, please keep your hand up. Perhaps I'm going to go ahead and unmute Pam. She was going to share something with us. Yes. Um, we found it easy to keep the communication going um, with us. The bank will usually call me or send me a notice that somebody is behind and then I can contact the family. We've also had very good response because um, of the relationship we developed that the families will call us prior to having an issue. Um, like we just had somebody recently, her husband gets laid off at a certain time each year. So she called us and said, you know, we had it taken out of his paycheck. Um, we're a couple months ahead of payment, but we'd like to get it taken care of so we know what to do um, in two months so we can keep those payments coming. So it's great to be able to have that flexibility. They've been calling and saying, we're not able to make it. We can make half now and half that a little bit later. So that's worked out well with us. Mm -hmm. And you're able to negotiate that with the bank just fine? Yes, um, the bank's been very good about um, letting us set up our guidelines as far as because sometimes individual people needed different things like one family, I don't know how, well, they've, they're our second oldest family so they've had their house for about 12 years and they um, for some reason started, started way back, I don't know when, making month, weekly payments instead of a monthly payment. So, of course, to be able to set it up for loan servicing, we had to make that clear with the bank that that's the way it was set up and that's the way they were used to it and that type of thing. So they let us set up specific guidelines for families. Okay. Yeah, so it sounds like there is still some flexibility there as long as you're in communication with the bank about what's going on. Um, Michelle is asking Pam, how much does the bank charge, if you're willing to talk about that? Pam's okay, so um, let's see, Angie has her hand raised again. Do you want to talk again, Angie? I can unmute you. If Let's see. I'm just Angie, unmuting you. Angie was, yeah, Angie was um, typing, and oh, that's okay. what we were hearing. <laughs> okay. Do okay, you want to talk? Unmuted. Yes, Pam, oh, you Pam are is unmuted on now. Mm -hmm. So who are we talking to? Pam, hi. Uh, okay. Do you want to do you want to answer the question about how much the bank? Yes, I can. Um, yeah. Luckily, um, certain banks um, have. To, they have to do so much community service within their thing, so check with your banks, and ours does not charge us anything because it's a community service project thing. Oh, very do. nice. Um, Angie is also saying that they do not charge them any fee, and that they get weekly notices from the bank of any delinquent mortgages, which is nice. Um, so there were a lot of, I did have some questions earlier from folks who were maybe doing things in-house. We also have some people from um, other states uh, mm -hmm. listening into the webinar today. So 
um, some new people who are just asking about third party service cost, um, you know, like how much does it cost to do it? So some of the this information that people are sharing is really helpful. Um, our folks in Douglas County said it's five dollars per payment. Um, and so I know I have some other comments down here um, and questions. Somebody asked if we were to move to a third party servicer, would the servicer take care of the escrow and taxes and keep track of all of that? Or would the affiliates treasurer still be responsible for that? And so I don't know if anybody wants to speak to the role of their treasurer at their affiliate in this process or because um, I think that that might be unique to that particular or to some affiliates. And um, we've had a couple questions about how the escrow and, and taxes and things are handled with servicers. And, uh, you know, Rachel, you can speak to that, but it's always nice to have affiliates share then too, or we can right. have Susan and chime in as well. But mm -hmm. we And I, I'm sure affiliates are more familiar with the, the specifics about it than I am. Um, how about we oh, try? I know it is that. Let's try the gang over in Douglas County again. We, I'm going to try unmuting them again. Okay. They've got their hands up, and we'll see if they're ready. Great. Hi there. Can you hear us? Hi. Yes. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi. You sound great. We weren't sure. We we don't have a question. We just did. You have a question for us? Oh well. Do you want to talk about your experience? Um, sure, we uh, service ours with Bremer, and we I'm the one who put $5 per payment, so if we have partial payments to a month, that could be $10. We still feel that's a value. Um, we This is our second mortgage, um, or second financial institution we've worked with. When I was hired, we were working with someone else. Um, Bremer treats it like one of their loans, and so the escrow is... Um, maintain more efficiently than with the previous bank. It was always a headache come audit time because the escrow balances that they had and our auditors never, um, I guess, it was difficult to even get them reconciled. Mm -hmm. And I found out through this webinar preparation that Bremer does report to the Credit Bureau. I was not aware of that. Great, that's another benefit of um, having the third-party services. So you're saying that Bremer does do your escrow analysis now? Yes, yes. Well, they mat there are servicers, so they do the escrow analysis and they call for us. They do things, you know, 15 days, 30, 60, 90. Um, they, I also, I'm one that does, um, the, the, we do outreach as well because they know me. I think there's a you know the personal relationship with the local affiliate, but it is nice when the uh, Bremer calls them as well because um, mm -hmm. they have ex experience. And I like to have a board member go with me or someone when I visit them at, in person at their home. Right. So it's still that personal contact. Yeah, and someone I think early on told me that we it's nice if you have a double uh, team approach because the bank is the financial relationship. We have that personal relationship, and right. so yeah. um, that's, I think, uh, although as we have a higher delinquency, uh, I probably have that bank, <laughs> both the mentality, but um, <laughs> they will respond to me, um, not always, but... That is, um, I think you you have to, you know, the affiliates are always involved, even if you move to a, a servicer. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we have a lot. Oh, I'm going to, I have to mute uh, those guys. Here we go. Um, I feel like we have a lot of questions, kind of really basic. We've got, you know, we've got affiliates in all kinds of levels and EDs with more or less experience, but a lot of questions just about kind of who does what, um, mm -hmm. you know, who does the bank then do the escrow analysis. Also, there's a lot of questions about that and comments then too from other affiliates about, yep, our bank take care, takes care of the escrow payment. Um, we have another question, a comment really about, we have a bank that takes in the payments and sends the escrow checks, but that is not what we are thinking of as third-party servicing at this time. Um, they do not charge us, but they are. this affiliate is looking at a servicer that takes care of payments, escrow, sending out letters, receipts, taxes, escrow analysis, etc. Um, they will do what we want them to do for homeowner contact. 
Um, currently they still handle this. Anyway, there's, there's a number of, um, comments like that. And I just, I had asked, uh, Susan, if maybe she wanted to speak to that, because there were those questions about the treasurer's role and, and some other, um, things like that. But I don't know, Susan, do you want to chime in on kind of how yeah, affiliates do that? It, it's, it super varies. Probably what the biggest, um, Variable is the size of the portfolio and whether or not you're having a third party do those items. In my mind, a third party servicers does servicer does those things that April just listed. So collects payments, sends out delinquency notices, has some contact with the homeowner, does the escrow analysis, does the pays the taxes and insurance and provides, you know, financial reporting based on that. And I would strongly recommend that. Now when you have a portfolio that's under, you know, five or less mortgages, or let's just say eight or less mortgages, you might not be inclined to have it um, serviced because of a cost. I, I look into the banks that have to do a Community Reinvestment Act, you know, community service like Pam mentioned to see if you can get them to do that. Um, it, when they're self-serviced, you know, it's, it's who's ever like, whatever warm body. So it could be a treasurer, it could be a bookkeeper, um, it could be a volunteer, but I'd say in all those cases, if they don't have experience doing those escrow analysis, you really want to find someone who does. You really want to find a financial institution that does. And the other advantage is reporting to the credit bureau. So that's my two cents. Thanks, Susan. That helped. Um, that actually leads us into, I know there are a lot of questions going on about third party servicers and I'm writing them down and I'll, um, and there's a lot I'll, of questions about what do you kind of, what do you get and how much does that cost? And right. I think that's where you're taking some of your survey results and digging in deeper mm -hmm. and we're hoping to do an OOFTA report that kind of, yeah, that we can share some information with our affiliates about, okay, so here's 20 that do have a servicer, several, a couple who are in the process of switching. So which servicer do you use? How much does it cost? And what I think there isn't a big consensus yet because some people have a relationship with their bank and are able to get that at no charge. Some people are using a, you know, some other thing, but it's been, I've heard anything, yeah, from like that five to even like seven, $8 per per loan per month, but that most people who've made that switch then feel like it's well, well worth the consistency and the accuracy and timeliness that they're able to rely on. Right. And we, I will be gathering more information about that and sharing that with people as I go. But then the other question that I really wanted to hit on was the issue of reporting to credit bureaus. Because this is a, out of the total affiliates that I surveyed, and this was a follow-up question, so I didn't get all the 28 affiliates that I originally did. But um, of the ones that I asked, the it says nine affiliates do report to the credit bureaus. Three of them aren't, aren't sure that they have it serviced, and they're just not sure. But then the no is all the eight affiliates that don't have their mortgage service it, serviced outside. Um, and it's going off of the same question, kind of the discussion uh, idea is that what are the benefits of reporting to credit bureaus? And I know a lot of people have concerns about it also. And so if you have concerns that you want to bring up to the group, please do. And we can talk about this. We have a couple hands up and actually quite a few hands up. Um, do you want me to <laughs> yeah. start? I'm just going to unmute people. You can also control your sound from, from your end, too, if you want to mute. But I'm going to do our friends in Douglas County first. It's a major advantage for homeowners who are current. Um, they may not. Some A lot of our families don't have a lot of credit um, cards. And so this is a way for them to establish positive credit. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. We've got, I'm just going to, yeah, Parker, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Hi, Parker. Well, I just want to second Lori's comments. Hi. Um, Lori's uh, <laughs> comments about it helping um, helping families uh, establish their, their credit 
uh, credit history. Uh, year after year, probably 80-85% of our families pay on time all the time. And right now, uh, the, at least our families aren't getting any credit, uh, credit, quote unquote credit for that. Um, now, we are uh, about to start uh, using um, the mortgage function under uh, Keystone. And as I understand it, that will mean that those payments will get uh, reported to um, the credit reporting agencies. So we think that's a good thing. Great, thanks for sharing. There's a, um, Eileen has a few comments here um, about, we don't use a third party servicer. We began reporting to the credit bureaus at the same time we started a mortgage stewardship committee and their delinquency rate is 4%. Um, she also added that by reporting to the credit bureau, our mortgage stewardship committee and mortgage delinquency policy has more teeth. Mm. Right. So it's more of an incentive to pay on time. Got a couple more hands up. Do you want to, let's hear from Wayne. Yeah. Hi, Wayne. Let's see. Wayne, are you there to talk with us? All right, I'm going to go ahead and mute again, and let's see, Shannon, I see your hand raised, but I don't think you're connected to audio, so I'm going to move on, and then we've got Pam. All right, Pam? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I put it down. Um, oh, there sorry. was the question about um, the treasurer. Our treasurer decided that she would like to have, you know, we looked into loan servicing. She thought it was very important because she was... Um, having to deal with trying to figure out the payments, the escrow payments, and if somebody was short, where the escrow payments would come out of, those type of things. And so we found out that um, it definitely was a benefit to our treasurer to be able to have it, the loan services and that. So um, also, it makes us more timely because notices um, were not being sent out because I would not find out till three weeks later or so that somebody was delinquent in their payments and then that so already we're past the 15 days that we're supposed to send out the first notice so it made us more timely and it made it much more easier for our treasurer for bookkeeping Great. so thanks Pam I'm gonna try Wayne again his hand went back up let's try this one more time hi Wayne hi can you hear me this time yes, yes. we can Hello. okay great um, I'm still trying to learn how to use this thing so uh, Conversely, uh, from what some of the folks said about how we want to reward those families that are making their payments on a timely basis, uh, and, and that's a wonderful thought, uh, but on the other hand, we're trying to help families that have been, a lot of times by virtually, uh, by virtue of things that are not their fault, they've already stamped down in life quite a bit, or stomped down, and, and by then further stomping on them with bad credit reports is something that really irritates me or worries me. Uh, but having heard a couple of other points of view now, um, maybe what I'll try to do in the future is uh, those families that want to have it reported to the credit uh, bureaus, then we'll do that for them. Uh, but the others, I'm still reluctant to report those uh, to the credit bureaus when they're having trouble paying. It's just a thought I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a concern that a, a few affiliates also have brought up is there there are families here that um, do struggle from time to time and maybe it's not even their fault but then you still if you're reporting that it will have a negative effect but it's finding that balance uh, there's a couple comments uh, and questions let's see uh, sort of connected to that. Some of these came up before that comment and some after, but some questions about for people that don't have a mortgage servicer, but report to credit agencies, how are they doing it? And then kind of connected to that, um, that a question about, I think there's some legal issues there. If you report on one, don't, do you have to report on all? Um, and then just want to, and I'll let you or others respond to that, but then there's also a question or a comment just about thinking about providing stable housing, changing the trajectory of success for a family, reporting to credit agencies creates the opportunity for families to access other forms of credit like education loans. Mm -hmm. So anyway, some questions about the, the 
legality or or even just how you go about reporting to credit bureaus if you're not using a mortgage servicer. So if anybody wants to mm -hmm. chime in, yeah, just... if anyone has an experience with that, I'd love to hear it too. Um, the other thing with the reporting to credit bureaus, if if they did qualify for a regular loan or a conventional loan, it would automatically be, well, most of the time, I'm assuming, um, would automatically be reported to the credit bureau. So it's whether or not you want to stay consistent with um, how most homeowners are experiencing mortgages or not. Um, I don't actually know the legality side of it. If you report on one, do you have to report on all? I don't know, Susan, if you know more about that. But I am not sure. I'll write that down. I, I don't. I don't know for sure. Okay. In general, I think you have to treat all your homeowners the same. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose most of the time, if you run into issues, or at least I would hope so, you're not going to foresee that. It's probably going to be um, an unexpected circumstance or something like that. Um, let's see. All right, so I'm going to look into the legality of some other stuff. There are some more topics that um, I would like to talk about, namely the, oh, this is just the overall benefits to the affiliate and the homeowner about reporting to credit bureaus. A lot of this has been echoed by people that say that it builds credit. That's mainly what the left column is saying, is that it builds credit for your homeowners that are paying on time. And it also reduces your liability of the affiliate because you don't have to collect the payments and be up to date on, you don't have to be as up to date on um, all of the laws and requirements. The servicer will take care of that in most cases. But anyway, um, these other discussion topics that I have, I want to talk about a little bit about um, automatic mortgage payments or automatic withdrawal because I, in talking to affiliates, I found that a lot of them give that option and it sounds to me that people are um, having good experiences with it, but I want to know if anyone has any particularly good or bad experiences with doing automatic payments for their homeowners and how that's affected their delinquency rates. Let's see. All right, Parker's got his hand raised. Hi, hey, Parker. Well, I did have my hand raised. I just lowered it. But uh, I was just going to respond to Wayne about the concern about uh, uh, reporting uh, delinquent yeah. homeowners. If you cannot make something as basic as a ho house payment, um, and, and in particular a house payment to Habitat, there are probably lots of other things, lots of other problems with your credit history. And uh, and I'm not. Uh, I wouldn't be concerned about adding uh, adding to the. Uh, I don't know. Making it making it worse by reporting uh, that information. That's that's all I wanted to say. So you're saying that not necessarily they're only a bad report on their or a bad thing on their credit report. So. Well, I'm just saying there's probably already a lot of other bad things on there, and adding and are adding something to it isn't going to make much difference. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, makes sense to me. <laughs> we have see. a comment about automatic payments that from Eileen said that automatic payments have greatly reduced the accounts receivable workload by multiple staff and have also helped homeowners' monthly budgeting easier. Right, so you don't have to worry about it. It's just automatically taken out of your account. Uh, another person comments, reporting delinquencies to credit bureaus can actually help homeowners, homeowners because it might prevent them from someone extending more credit to them that they cannot afford. That's a really thoughtful comment. Um, and let's see, another person said, we only have one homeowner who's on the automatic withdrawal ACH, but when... She changed her payment amount. Her bank debited our account instead. Um, and this sounds like a unique situation, but um, now they're being difficult for her to reset it up, and she's going directly to our bank to deposit. Um, 
but she, <laughs> Jill realizes it usually works better than this, but it's a funny, thinks it's a funny story to share. So <laughs> all kinds of things can go wrong in, in any, any situation, I guess, but yeah. Okay. And we can get the, we'll get the answer about that credit reporting thing. I'm doing a little right. looking right now, but we can certainly just ask, um, just confirm that with Tara, some of the, some of the legal counsel at, at HHI, and we'll just make mm -hmm. sure we get that response in our follow-up so we don't leave anybody hanging. Right. Let's see. Okay. Um, if, I don't know, are there any other comments about automatic withdrawal? Any other questions or concerns about doing that? I know we talked to a couple affiliates that were either confused about how you do that or um, had some concerns with it. Let's see, Jerry is saying that when they moved to ACH, we had some families who really fought it, and we found that going that way and following the policies, um, emphasized following the policies, has made staying current easier for our families. Clear guidelines and process has strengthened our families. That's interesting. Um, right, because Jerry and up in Northwoods requires that they do ACH homeowners. Let's see, okay. All right, Michelle is asking, um, Michelle is asking whether or not um, HFHI is going to be having more information about this and they will soon, supposedly. <laughs> They'll have a checklist coming out about mortgage servicing, but just look for that. Well, let's see, it's right after noon, so if anyone has any final questions or thoughts that they really want to share. Let's see, Angie is asking, how do you require automatic payments if families are not banked? Jerry, do you want to respond to that? Okay, so otherwise, let's see. We have. Can we address? Jerry is the, responding, saying that sorry. they have a bank. Yeah, they have a bank that provides free savings accounts if they don't already have them. Um, Angie wants to know if, if anyone that reports to credit bureaus on their own, if they could share how they do it. Yeah, we didn't really get a response to that. And, and Angie, mm -hmm. if we don't hear something today, and Rachel hears something, she can, she'll loop back with you and, and right. find out about that. Uh, do you want to talk about the role of mentors or is anybody else want to talk about the role of mentors? Right, so that was an option here about having family mentors get involved with um, homeowner, if homeowner becomes delinquent. So after they've moved in, whether or not you have family mentors still guiding them or partnering with them to figure out budgeting and that kind of stuff. And let's see, Parker has his hand raised. Um, you are unmuted, uh, well, so Parker. That, okay, well we just actually, uh, just within the past month or so, in, uh, in discussion with, family, with the Family Support Committee, I said I'd like us to start following up with families that are having trouble becoming successful homeowners. And uh, they, they they agreed that that was something that they would be that they would do, and so actually I think it was just yesterday I sent out the first letters to families that simply say, you know, um, you we understand that from time to time you will face challenges, and uh, if you and we're, we we want to continue to provide any support to you that uh, that you think might be helpful. And it was, it was it was basically an invitation to ask for help, and uh, we'll see what happens. So you haven't received any responses as of this point. Well, no. since the letter went out yesterday right. or the day before, <laughs> I, I unless I, I haven't gotten my mail yet today, or I haven't gotten any phone calls. So, oh, actually, I do have a phone call. I have a message. So maybe it's a homeowner saying, who knows. <laughs> Yeah, well, you have to keep us updated on that and see how it goes. Um, does anyone else have any 
experiences with family mentors and um, uh, I have a comment um, from a, a Stacy who says when we have a delinquent homeowner their mentor is the first person we call and the mentor will first approach the family and see what if any problems they're having it's also a great way to keep the mentor volunteers active um, ah, and that's yeah. an affiliate that is currently servicing their own mortgages as well. So mm -hmm. that's that first step. Um, let's see. Um, just a comment about great webinar, Rachel. And, uh, <laughs> and another one that says not ideal. Oh, this is Jerry must be responding. Just maybe you already said that. Not ideal, but we have set up with our bank to allow homeowners to deposit into a designated account. Oh, so that's following up with yeah, um, yeah. automatic payments. Uh, but then Eileen also added that not all of our older families, I assume that means in their homes longer, uh, have mentors, <laughs> but delinquent families are offered a new budget coach. And uh, Jill just added that we have our family support committee assist with struggling homeowners. And I think that's pretty common mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Uh, and we've got one more chat. Let's see. Somebody just commented also, right, Stacey added, we should have a webinar just on third-party servicing. And mm -hmm. uh, and just great job, Rachel. <laughs> great, thanks. <laughs> Which I would echo. I chatted that to everybody, just that this is exactly how the VISTA program should work. And we are so uh -huh. lucky to have Rachel and, and for all of you for just having so many comments and being so engaged. It really makes this more yeah. valuable for everyone and certainly keeps us on our toes with trying to... <laughs> capture all the chats and comments and questions and people's right. hands. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got one more raised hand. I'm going to unmute Pam and then we probably need to wrap up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You know what? My, my hand says it's lowered, but <laughs> so I'm confused. So I okay. do not have a raised hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank all right. Thanks Pam. All right, well, um, I know we didn't get to all of these questions either, so if you have more questions for me, feel free. Um, I'll be sending out an email in the next couple of days, um, and you can just reply to that or give me a call um, at any time. If you have questions about these topics and I can help you find the answer, I can ask around for you. So. I'm always available as a resource if you need it, but I want to say thank you to everyone for being so active. That's been great and 